Hello everyone. So I welcome you all in this session, uh, which is pertaining to editorial analysis. Uh, in this session, we are going to take up two very important topics in terms of UPSC examination, which has been in the news for the past couple of months and a lot of articles have also come, a lot of editorials have also come on those topics. So again, I welcome you all in this session of editorial analysis where we are going to discuss the, especially the last one week, the major editorials which has come in the newspaper, the leading newspaper in the last one week. So the two very important topics in terms of GS3 economy, which has been in the news is first the RBI releasing the or pilot release of central bank digital currency. So we'll see everything related to digital banks, central bank digital currency, which is what we're calling as e-rupee, a very, very important topic can be a potential question in prelims also as well as in the mains examination also. And another very important topic uh, which has been uh, in the news for quite some time is some of the states wants to go back to old pension scheme. In fact, two or three states have already done it and you no, know, they want to go back to the old pension scheme and also in some of the pole bound states. All right, some of the pole bound states, the contesting parties are also saying that if we are winning the election or we come to the power, we will go back to the old pension scheme. So we will also see the this debate of old pension scheme versus new pension scheme. All right. So let us start the discussion. So first theme uh, which we are choosing is central bank digital currency or you can call it as e-rupee. All right. So for your reference, I have taken two editorials which has come. First is first had come in the live mint paper, newspaper. Another is a very good explainer which has come in the business line, the Hindu business line newspaper. So we will try to understand what is CBDC, what is the features of it. Again, uh, you know, the significance of CBDC, what can be the potential benefits of the CBDC and some of the concerns, some of the associated concerns, what are they? All right. So what is CBDC? Central Bank Digital Currency. All right. At this moment, the notion of currency which most of the individual might be having is physical cash. All right. So I have the physical cash. I can do the transaction. Now you deposit your physical cash into the, let us say, bank account and you can do the transaction digitally all right so even if even if your money is there in the bank account and you are able to do the digital transaction all right but the underlying point is the physical cash all right so here the cbdc is currency in digital form all right which is issued by the rbi all right so cbdc is currency issued by rbi in digital form so if you talk about uh, what would be the form it would be digital or electronic who will be issuing it central bank or RBI will be issuing it and it has, it has everything which uh, money, it has every characteristic which money has. 
for example it is a medium of transaction all right it is a store of value for future transaction so whatever attributes is there with in terms of physical cash the same is there with the central bank digital currency the only differentiating factor is that it is in digital form it is in digital form it is in digital form it is a uh, issued by rbi again it is a fiat currency as well as legal tender all right it is fiat currency as well as legal tender fiat currency meaning you uh, know it is being issued by the on the direction of the government and legal tender meaning that nobody can deny the transactions all right nobody can deny the transactions all right if i am taking something from a let us say shopkeeper and i am giving him the cbdc he or she cannot say that i will not take this medium of transaction so that is what is meaning of legal tender so that is another part of it another important feature is same with physical currency is that it it is a part of liability of central bank so if you are making the balance sheet of the rbi it will be shown on the liability side all right so liability of rbi all right it is a liability of rbi then another very important theme is that it will not require a person to have a kind of bank account all right it will be kind of token uh, money should is what rbi is thinking of all right so you can use it you can transfer it from one point to another or from one person to another without the use of bank account that is one thing which differentiate the cbdc from let us say upi and every other digital transaction medium for example upi rtgs neft there you are requiring the transfer from one bank account to another bank account the money is being exchanged so in one account it is being no debited in another account it is being credited all right so here the banks are involved or banks accounts are involved now let us say you know uh, if we are talking about cbdc it may be the case that you know these tokens are transferred from one individual to another without the use of bank account so that is one thing which you need to keep in mind now coming to why cbdc why at this moment rbi is looking into or you no know, is starting the pilot project for cbdc what are the <coughs> background scenarios which has inspired rbi to go for in uh, use of or pilot use of cbdc so first thing you can say that the this year budget announced that rbi will come out with the you uh, know cbdc then uh, few months back rbi released the concept note on cbdc and on 1st of november as well as 1st of december they have started the pilot project in terms of cbdc wholesale and cbdc retail the two versions of cbdc which rbi is thinking of all right so in terms of what has inspired rbi to you know go for cbdc is first and foremost is very significant factor is uh, you know prevalent use of virtual private currencies or you can say that bitcoin and all all right so the use of cryptocurrencies all right the use of cryptocurrencies has 
is one of the motivating factor for the RBI to issue the CBDC. Why? Because the uh, bitcoins and all are the virtual private currencies are based on decentralized technology. They are not issued by any government or let us say any central bank. So what they try to do is they try to come up with a parallel <coughs> rupee or parallel uh, currency with regard to where the neither the government nor the central bank has any control. All right. So since they are you no know, distributed based on blockchain technology and they are not issued by RBI or the government. So they have very limited control over it. Now imagine a situation where there is a you know wide use of bitcoins, uh, one of the most used cryptocurrencies and the RBI, the central bank of the country is not able to properly calculate the liquidity which is there in the economy. Why? Because, because they do not have any control over the money flowing through the cryptocurrencies. All right. Now, in terms of uh, inflation control, in terms of repo rate, it will be difficult for them to come out with a efficient and effective monetary policy because they do not have control over or do not have complete picture of the total liquidity which is there in the economy. So that is why this is a very significant uh, motivation for RBI because there was so much prevalent of or use of virtual private currencies which can threaten the sovereign or the financial stability of the country. So RBI thought why not come out with its own digital currency. All right. So CBDC, it is issued by the RBI. It is not issued by anybody. It is based on decentralized technology, whether it, it is based on centralized. All right. It is centralized where RBI and other uh, banks may have certain knowledge about it. All right. So another very important factor which RBI says that or no, just uh, uh, be away from the virtual private currencies is that they are most likely their value is mostly volatile, not stable. All right. You, the recent FTX uh, exchange rate uh, saga, which has seen that their value can fall down very easily or their value can go up very easily. So volatility is one of the very important thing associated with virtual private currencies, which RBI, which is a very concern for the RBI, which will not be a case with CBDC since it is you know, backed by sovereign. So it will be mostly is stable in its value, is stable in its value. So these are the things related with CBDC versus the virtual private currencies, the Bitcoins, the Ethereum, all cryptocurrencies. Next comes, what are the potential benefits which we should know or what can accrue from the use of CBDC? All right. So benefits can accrue to the all stakeholders, all right, to all stakeholders. For example, individuals all right. So faster transaction, efficient transaction fraud less transaction all right do not require a bank account let us say that can be there when we are dealing with cbdc another thing is it can improve the financial inclusion in the country all right it can improve the financial inclusion more and more people can come under the ambit of 
financial inclusion due to use of this CBDC. All right. So for individuals, you can say these are the benefits. Let us say corporates. One of the benefits which can accrue to the corporates is that uh, no, inter-country transactions, they can be faster and cheaper. With the use of CBDC, inter-country transaction can be faster as well as cheaper. All right, because most of the corporates are dealing with the payments with to other nations or to other uh, to the entities which are located in different countries. So cross country transactions will become easier with the use of CBDC as well as become faster also with the use of CBDC. In terms of let us say uh, you know, government, how it helps uh, government. So use of CBDC will have all the transactions will have digital trail. It will be very difficult for the people to you know use of black money, which is there in terms of physical cash. So since uh, every transaction would have digital trail, so black money use of black money will be reduced and more and more tax to the government can be there. So one of the potential benefit is tax can increase increase in taxation to the government uh, uh, the corresponding is reduction of black money all right reduction of black money to the government all right another important thing which you can think of since you know all the transactions let us say or most of the transactions are having a digital trail so overall government would have a good sense of economic activity going on in the country. All right, economic activity going on in the country, which can have potential Im impact on estimation of GDP. GDP estimation can be more accurate because we are knowing the or we are closer in estimating the overall economic activity in the country. That is why GDP estimation can also improve. All right. Also, one of the very you know, significant benefit can be that targeting the people or targeting the beneficiaries can be easier. All right, especially let us say in terms of COVID pandemic where government want to transfer money to the bank accounts of the needy person or in terms of any other disaster which has occurred. No, the transfer of money to the eligible beneficiaries will be easier. So that can be the potential gain for the government. And if you talk about RBI and other banks, all right, RBI and other banks. First and foremost is the monetary policy transmission will be more effective. All right, monetary policy transmission will be more effective in terms of use of CBDC. Why? Because once you are starting CBDC, most of the transactions are being registered we are having a digital trail of the transactions so estimating the overall liquidity will be more easier and more closer to reality all right so that is why monetary policy transmission would also be more easy so these are the things uh, related to what are the you know potential benefits accruing with the use of CBDC in terms of various stakeholders which are there, all right, which are there. So next is what are the, despite the benefit, there are potential concerns which are related with the CBDC. 
all right uh, it's not all rosy picture out there so <coughs> what are the potential concerns of the cbdc which as an aspirant you should know all right so first is very important is a term is called as it can lead to or widespread use of cbdc can lead to disintermediation of banks all right disintermediation which is uh, absolutely not required or which should not happen what does it mean is that if more and more people are placing their money in form of cbdc then the money going to the let us say saving account for the banks will reduce all right let us say i have a 100 rupees earlier in case of e rupee it was 10 and rest all was physical cash where i was let us say depositing 50 rupees to the bank now with larger use of cbdc now let us say this has gone to 50 all right this has gone to 50 so i am not depositing anything in bank because 50 is my expenditure let us say so it may be the case that with the large scale use of cbdc people find it easier to keep it with themselves and the amount going to the savings bank account to the banks will reduce now how it will impact the uh, economy see the money deposited in the saving bank account is a no, usually bank provides uh, interest of somewhere around let us say 2%, 2.5%, 3%, somewhere around that. So it is a kind of cheap money for the bank. So the cost of credit when the bank is lending to the potential people or potential let us say industrialist that can increase if this corpus of saving account reduces. If this corpus of saving account reduces, cost of lending by the banks will increase because now this bank is not having access to this cheap money. So that can be very detrimental for the economic growth of the country. Obviously, RBI will not you know, keep this factor in the mind when they are going for the full use of cbdc it is one of the potential scenario which may happen all right next if you talk about concerns so with all the digital things going on uh, one of the very significant challenge will be cyber security all right cyber security any attack any malware attack or any attack on the you know our payment gateway or anything will disrupt our financial transaction so that is one thing cyber security another argument which is being given by the critics is that it can be a threat to privacy of an individual so at this moment what happens is even though you know you majority of your transaction might be uh, having a digital trail we are using a digital instrument but at least a certain percentage of your let us say uh, transaction is still being done in the physical cash which is outside the uh, you know purview of the government meaning that government do not uh, have the clear uh, thing whether you are transacting with whom so that is where they are saying that with the use of CBDC, even the small transactions will have a digital trail and it might lead to or it might have threat to uh, you know, privacy or individual privacy. That is another thing which they are talking about privacy concerns. All right. 
that is also one of the thing is we are talking about another potential scenario is like in case of default of a bank or bank run all right the rbi may put certain condition on taking out the physical cash because it becomes difficult to take out or let us say rbi can say that now only you can uh, take out from the atm let us say 20000 or 30000 per day so it becomes a little difficult to take out the money if there is a kind of destabilization of banking system or that bank but in case of cbdc it can be very easily transferred so that is also one concern the flight of money can be there which is difficult in terms of when you are you no know, taking out the actual cash so that is also one of the concerns of cbdc so this is a overall scenario or overall view of cbdc i have especially taken the things which is especially important from the examination perspective and understand that question may be asked in prelims also uh, on the features of cbdc all right its comparison with let us say virtual private currencies as well as questions a potential question may be there in the mains that all right pros and cons of the cbdc so that is uh, all the things related with cbdc now let us move ahead take the another very interesting topic uh, which is there in the news all right old pension scheme versus new pension scheme so this is also one of the topic which is uh, continuously there in the news and i have taken the two editorials one where swaminath ayer is talking about this and another is this is from economic times and this is from business line all right so people are so here the context is that <clears throat> several states for example jharkhand chatisgarh rajasthan have reverted back to a system which was prevalent earlier which was called as old pension scheme ops all right old pension system or old pension scheme and the they have gone back to that scheme so what is the new pension scheme the pension scheme which central government started from january 1 2004 january 1 2004 the pension scheme started after that is new pension scheme and before that the pension scheme was called as or the term is called as whatever the pension scheme was existing as old pension scheme so this is a you can say cut off date january 1 ke baad hai that is a new pension scheme and before that old pension scheme was prevalent so now what has the thing is that let us say new pension scheme is started from 2004 central government says that no new joinee to the central government will be having a will be their un, eligible under new pension scheme most of the states uh, no they transferred or they translated from old pension scheme to new pension scheme now cut to 2022 the scenario is that three or two or three states have again gone back to this old pension scheme which were prevalent before the january 1 2004 all right another context here is that in some of the poll bound states where the state legislative election is due you no know, the contesting parties are saying that they are putting this in their manifesto that they will also if they come to the power if they win the election they will revert back to this old pension scheme so this is the context which has highlighted this debate of old pension scheme versus new pension scheme so we will see all right so in india 
we do not have a universal social security all right so pension is very much needed uh, for the people for the it act as a social security net so what is pension so it is a monthly you can say that income monthly income of people who have retired from the government or state services all right so if we are talking about old pension scheme we are talking about old pension scheme so what was the major characteristics of old pension scheme basically the last drawn salary all right last drawn salary the 50% of basic salary would be your fixed monthly pension once you retire all right let us say your last drawn salary uh, is let us say rupees 100 so 50% of this let us say this is a basic salary only so 50% of is so rupees 50 you will be your monthly pension once you retirement post retirement this will be your pension so that is a one thing second thing is the entire burden of providing this pension the entire burden of providing the pension lies on the government be it central government or be it state government all right so one thing which you can say that old pension scheme was not co-contributory the person who was who have to get the pension after the retirement he was not contributing any part to that pension the whole responsibility of providing the pension post retirement whole expenditure is borne by government whole expenditure is borne by the government that is another point which you have to understand so it is not co-contributory entire burden of you no know, expenditure of pension was borne by the government and the what was the pension 50 percent of the last drawn salary or basic salary which is there so this is related to old pension scheme certain characteristics or certain features now what what were the concerns uh, or what were the challenges associated with uh, old pension scheme uh, so that uh, you know uh, it the government tried to reform it bring out the pension reform so what was the certain apprehensions concerns associated with opc all right concerns if you talk about all right first is entirely borne by government all right it was entirely uh, the whole pension expenditure was entirely borne by government basically what happens is every year government presents a budget in that budget the pension allocation for pension was done okay this year let us say 100 crore is allocated for providing pensions to the central government employees so entire burden on government that is the first thing and the most significant thing was there was that was there was no dedicated corpus which was there for this providing the fund all right so no dedicated corpus or it was unfunded there was no dedicated corpus as such uh, for the providing pensions to the people all right next point is 
due to increase in you no know, longevity of the people the amount of pensions has increased first i know people are living more than let us say 80 years 85 years 90 years so the pension outgo is more that is the first thing second thing is even in case of pension periodic revisions are made when government increases the dearness allowances all right for example let us say when you retired you are getting 50000 as your pension after certain time, let us say six months, one year, government revised the dearness allowances for pensioner based on the prevailing inflation situation in the country. Now, let us say after one year, due to rise in dearness allowances, your pension increased to 52,000. So, 2,000 increase. So, it was not such that uh, the pension which you are getting after retirement is same across the you no know, year or lifelong it was a periodical increase in pension was made that also resulted in rise in burden of pension expenditure on the government on one hand there is increase in longevity period of you no know, that uh, people who are you know, living, they are crossing 80, 85 years, 90 years of age. And on the other hand, the periodic revisions to the pension. Both increased the amount required for pension payment. All right. So, it became or it was quite unsustainable for the government to carry out this process you know, ever carry out in the long term because you don't have any corpus, any dedicated corpus for the funds uh, for providing pensions. Also, the pension outgo is increasing year by year due to increase in longevity, also due to increase in periodic revisal of the pensions. So, ultimately, what it uh, was thought that this system will become unsustainable. All right, because see government what was doing is, let us say this is the budget of the government. This is the budget of the government. And let us say 30% of the budget is for pensions. And you also know that pension comes under the revenue expenditure, more and more revenue expenditure at the cost of capital expenditure, at the cost of capital expenditure. So, this is what is increasing, the increasing pensions due to various factors. It clearly became that this system may become unsustainable and also increase the revenue expenditure of the government in, in place of capital expenditure which is more productive. All right. So, the Bajpayee government in 2004, so they came out with a new pension scheme on January 1st, 2004 because of all the concerns which are uh, you know, associated with the this old pension scheme. So, apart from concerns, if you talk about, let us say, some uh, positives, what are the, let us say, can you can say benefits, benefits, all right, surety of amount of the pensions which you have, all right, surety of the amount. Another very, very significant factor was because government job provided surety of pension. So, it was seen as a very lucrative job. So, it attracted top talents of the country because they understood that there is security of job as well as pension after you retire. 
that is a so this was very much into the uh, influencing the top talents of the country to come and join the government services so that was one of the motivating factor for the people another significance can be you know if let us say the person who is getting the pension dies so his or her spouse will continue to get the pension that was another thing uh, benefits you can say that so all those things was there with the old pension scheme all right old pension scheme now but with regard to the lot of concerns the government switched to new pension scheme on january 1st 2004 so what is this new pension scheme so earlier what used to happen is that once you retire 50% of your last drawn salary the basic 50% of the basic will be your uh, this pension so it was very much defined now what government tries to do is that it will be a co contributory thing all right the person who has to receive the pension after retirement will contribute something also there will be contribution from the government so uh, in the new pension scheme uh, the person contributes 10% of his basic salary whereas the government contributes 14% all right government contributes 14 so 10% 10 percent by the individuals and 14% by the government so for example let us say your salary is basic salary is 100 so you will be contributing rupees 10 and he uh, government will be contributing rupees 14 so this 24 rupees will be going on the corpus of new pension scheme or they, we have a fund all right so these contribution co contribution you will make contribution towards the pension which you will be getting after your retirement all right so co contributory scheme so uh, 10% as well as 14%. So the government, central government has mandated that you no know, after the new joinees after January 1, 2004 will come under the new pension scheme. Also, this corpus will be generated first by this co-contribution factor. Again, these fund will be invested in several equity as well as debt instrument so that market linked profits can be generated market linked profits can be generated or market linked returns can be generated over a period of time all right so what changed in nps burden on government lowered all right the burden of pension expenditure on government lowered however there was contribution from the employee now earlier there was everything from the employer side whether the government or whether the state government now the employee has also to contribute for this pension which he is going to get after his retirement all right so that is the first thing which you have to understand second thing is it increased the coverage of pension earlier pension was restricted to central government job or state government job when old pension scheme was there so there was very reach was very skewed the reach of pension was very much skewed limited only the central government employee or the 
state government employee is going to get the pensions. Now with the NPS, all right. Now with the NPS, even the government employee can open their NPS account. Even an individual can open their NPS account. All right. So this reach has increased. You can say that the overall people coming under this pension, let us say those who are going to get pension after a certain uh, period of time has increased. Earlier there was very much limited to central government and state government. Now, you no know, private sector individuals also have come under that net. So that is related to national pension scheme. Other you know, nitty gritties are also there which can be asked in the prelims that is but overall is this that you have to co-contribute and that fund is utilized uh, you know, to invest in the other instrument equity instrument or debt instrument to generate market linked returns. All right. So that is a overall theme of NPS. <coughs> Right. overall theme of new pension scheme which government is implementing since January 1, 2004. Now why this uh, uh, debate of switching back to the old pension scheme? Now what are the arguments they are putting forward? Major, majorly because of the let us say criticism of NPS. So if you talk about certain concerns related with NPS, so first can be <coughs> uncertainty. I do not know how much pension I will get once I get retired. Why? because the contribution which I am making or government is also making that corpus is being utilized for generating market linked returns. So it can be positive, it can be negative. So that is why one of the argument which is being put forward is that there is uncertainty over the amount of pension which one is going to get. All right, That is the first thing. <coughs> Uh, market linked returns. Another point which is being uh, highlighted is that since it is a co-contributory scheme, all right, where an employee is also contributing in the fund or pension fund, so his his or her take away home salary is reducing all right so uh, no <coughs> individual contribution so his or her take away salary is getting reduced so it may be one of the factor that it is not producing enough demand because i am taking back less salary uh, with me Right. That is one of the things which is also highlighted. Another thing is there, once you <coughs> achieve or once you exit from the scheme, what is there is once you retire also, what is there is you will get lump sum of 60% which you have got at that moment and the next 40% you have to again invest in the annuity. So lump sum is only bulk, mein agar aap baat karo, only 60% you can take. All right, only 60% will be take out at that moment. Next 40% you have to invest in the annuity. So that is also the thing which is there. Uh, so these are <coughs> certain concerns uh, related with NPS and this is the overall picture of the debate which is going on with regard to switching back or reverting back to the old pension scheme. Uh, these themes you can connect with the uh, no, debate of freebies which is being there, debate of let us say revity culture which is being there. Uh, 
also there is a demand that you know uh, election commission should uh, also get to know that or it should be there properly there the physical implication of the things which political parties are doing in the poll promise all right how you are going to fund the promises which you are being made into the your election manifesto all right so that is one thing where uh, this thing you can uh, also write so overall <coughs> these are the two important these were the two important themes uh, which is there with regard to prelims also with regard to mains also i hope you had a certain understanding or you got certain perspective on the these topics all right so all the best keep practicing keep writing all right thank you